Um, I gave a lecture last year, and I gave a bit more of an intro. I'm not really going to give much of an intro into the practice, but we are based between London, Bristol, and Oklahoma. We've got about 40 of us in Bristol, actually. Um, we do uh, a lot of projects all over the UK. Um, this is a project some of you may know. We do, you know, schools. Obviously, this is a school which won the Sterling Prize 2015, Burntwood School. Um, current projects include um, new headquarters for Scotland Yard um, in Westminster, television centre, so this is the former BBC headquarters, um, now turned into a thousand homes, half a million square foot of offices. So a real wide variety of projects, um, white collar factory, a reinvention of, a, I suppose, a, a, an office warehouse typology in a high rise um, uh, context in Shoreditch. So, um, I asked Jordan kind of what people would like to kind of, I suppose, hear. I understand housing is kind of a hot topic and we're actually doing quite a few housing projects in and around Bristol at the moment. So I thought that'd be really interesting just to talk about housing um, in a local context. But also um, a lot of the housing we normally do in London is, uh, you know, what you'd expect, big kind of market-driven housing. But actually the three projects I'm going to show you uh, a little bit quirky, a little bit different, um, so from different ends of the spectrum, so non-standard housing typologies, I suppose, is the theme. And then the secondary theme, which, again, I thought was really interesting, and I hadn't really thought about this until yesterday, the kind of one common thread through all three projects, three different clients, is the idea of community uh, at its very central kind of core to the brief, um, and that's really, really important. Uh, but it wasn't necessarily explicit in the brief, but it does really bind the projects together. So uh, just a few intro slides about kind of housing and perception of housing. In the UK, kind of what is housing? How do we perceive it? Is this a romantic idea of every, everybody's got a castle or this, um, you know, lovely um, kind of quaint village house? Or, or is it this, you know, Hong Kong, high rise, density housing? It's all housing. It's all great. Um, but, you know, you know, and then architects, we've got our own perception of what housing is as well. Uh, about how people should live in our houses as well, when the reality sometimes is, is, is very different. I think it's really important to put that into context. Uh, think about, you know, it's the user, um, and people will necessarily, they live in the house the way they want to, rather than how we kind of think about it. So it's a really cool cartoon, that one. Um, and also, I mean, the projects I'm going to show you as well have this idea in mind as well. If you look at the centre of that, that tends to be how we think about housing in the market, is, you know, one and two bed flats, let's just rack them and stack them in the center of town, where actually we need to be thinking much wider. So one of the projects I'm going to show you is a retirement home. And it kind of makes sense in a way that if you make attractive retirement homes, people will go there earlier, have fun, live longer, due to the health and social benefits. That frees up housing in terms of the housing stock which is there, which actually just starts that cycle in a much nicer way. So that's a really, really important thing, which we're only getting to grips with in the UK now. And it's, uh, uh, it, it's, it's, it's kind of key to some of our projects. So I'm going to show you three, kind of three and a half projects really, maybe four, um, projects in and around Bristol dotted there. One of them is actually dead in terms of it, the site was sold, but it's really relevant actually. It was right, quite an interesting project for us, uh, and I'll tell you why when I get to it. So I'm going to start off with the one in the middle, Queen Victoria House. It's right by the Downs, and this is a retirement home, but not as you know it. So the client is Pegasus Life. You should look them up, actually. They work with about 12 different architects, really, really good architects. So we're very proud to be working with them. And they, they really are looking at the top-end retirement homes, looking at targeting people when they're 55 rather than kind of 75. So it's not needs-based. It's actually a choice where people go. Um, and they might go there when they're still working. Um, but it, really, really interesting brief. Every single development is different, bespoke to suit the nature of the, the context um, and you know, that particular city site, however. So very urban projects as well, although the one on the top is a beach site. Um, this is their kind of strap line, uh, which is great. Again, look on their website, loads of kind of cool things there. But retirement, living for a generation defined by who they are, not how old they are. So you think about, you know, these are you know, the, the, the kind of the mod generation, the baby boomers, what do they want? The urbanites as well, they don't want to go to stuffy old homes in the countryside. They want to live in Hampstead and Clifton and all these cool places and they want to, you know, go surfing and cycling too. And there's nothing wrong with that, it's great. So this is the site, it's called Queen Victoria House. Really, really cool old building. Started out life as a, um, it was a 
a school, prep school, then it was um, a convalescent home, then it turned into a maternity hospital, and then uh, it was an office building, and now it's going to be a retirement home. It's a really interesting cycle. I mean, there's, a, there's an hour-long presentation on that building alone, but I'll, I'll kind of cycle through this quite quickly. But it's a really, really cool part of town, massive gardens in a very kind of dense urban, suburban um, um, kind of area on the top of uh, White Ladies Road by Black Boy Hill. So this is it in its kind of convalescent home days. The rear garden turned into this kind of amazing croquette pitch. It was really great. So there's a massive level difference down into the gardens. So we were tasked with not only restoring the old building, but looking at, I suppose, doubling the amount of stuff on site, which was actually quite controversial. It took us a year and a half to get planning, which is another hour-long presentation I could give you, but I won't. Um, so our tactics really were to look at Really, there was an extension to the north of that red line, which was done in the 1960s. So we weren't going to build at all in front of the old buildings. So we set up this no-build zone um, to, the, to the south. And we were going to build on the car park site. So that became the development zone. And we came up with this idea. We looked at many different config configurations. This idea of these two pavilions, which run parallel um, to Queen Victoria House, the main block. And this is more, I suppose, relevant when you look at the wider views across Bristol and you get that kind of tearing of the topography. You think about um, Clifton Down, you know, those lovely rows and Totter Down as well. This is kind of part of that narrative just higher up on the, on the hill, really. But also it allows views through from the street as well to the gardens, which we thought was really, really important because when you're coming up Redland Hill, you get these brilliant mature trees you see over the wall, and that was a really nice part of it as well. But also, I think when you're... I suppose in later in life, you might be more in your house as well. You really want to encourage views onto the garden as well. So we came up with this idea of reinterpreting a bay window. And bay windows are great for that. You're in a, a kind of static position and you get 180 degree views. Um, so we kind of came up with a contemporary take on that, that kind of castellated um, facade, which gave oblique views out onto the gardens. But it also started to break down the, you know, the size of the blocks and start to, to reflect the proportions of the old house as well. So um, this is kind of early studies on that, um, that idea of a kind of contemporary version of the bay window. And then on the right-hand side, uh, kind of where we are at planning. So that's kind of what we're currently delivering. It's just on site at the moment. Um, so that's a bit of fun, actually. It really helps break down the mass of the building and just give a, a nice twist as you're kind of wandering around the building. You know, this castellated roof as well. Really important part about these projects. It's not just about the kind of the the accommodation, but this idea of community, the communal living and the communal offer is really, really important. So all that's yellow there, that's the coolest stuff. That's all kind of hairdressers, lounge, business suite, restaurant. And then on the lower, um, you'll remember that the gardens tear down where the croquette pitches were. That's going to be a pool, gym, spa, really nice stuff opening onto the gardens. So there's a p parking podium which is being hidden by that stuff. So you never see cars, they're really evil. Um, so you kind of you, you look out onto the gardens when you're um, in the pool. So restaurant, we've got this lounge area, which is really lovely. Um, hydrotherapy pool and spa. Um, yeah, really, really cool stuff. And that really does make that, in general, that sense of community and really brings people together. Um, and then when it comes to the accommodation, you know, if you're moving from a big house, in Clifton or Synod Park or somewhere like that, you know, you've got stuff you've, you, on your used to space. So we think about these, you know, much more volumetric um, uh, apartments. So this is almost 100 square meters for a two bed, which is easily 30, 40 percent over market averages. So that's it's great. Um, and also we kind of conceive this this plan. This is in the new build. You know, we think about open plan living, you walk in, you see everything. We didn't want that. We wanted this journey. It's almost like a two-bedroom house or a two-story house on a single level. This kind of journey through the apartment, you know, just a really nice way of the apartment unfolding as you walk through it. It's not kind of all there. Um, and again, lots and lots of storage. And then in the old building as well, which is magnificent, you know, four meters floor to ceilings. And uh, I, I suppose the key to working with an old building is the old building, you know, you, you don't just shoehorn stuff in. You're going kind to of celebrate, you know, the, the volume, the space as well. So the apartments in the old building are even bigger because they need to be because of the scale of the actual spaces. So um, yeah, really interesting. Every apartment is different in the old building. We're in the kind of new build. We've got more repetition, more things stack, um, and I suppose that offers people a choice as well as to kind of really interesting when these come for sales. Who wants to live in the old building? Who wants to live in the new stuff? But that's kind of yet to be uh, tested. 
So a quick journey um, kind of through the building. So starting on Redland Hill, you get a sense of the relationship between the new and the old. We've got a, uh, a little rooftop pavilion on the old building as well, or the extension. I think the idea of curb appeal and you know, first impressions is really important too. So this is kind of the entrance. We've cut a new hole um, into the wall, which brings you into the main entrance and then brings you through. Everyone comes through the main entrance um, onto a kind of a, a south-facing terrace which is the kind of the real gin and tonic moment. Uh, uh, and you, you kind of see the, the kind of buildings together. Um, and then that's in the courtyard um, between um, the two new build blocks. And the idea of what you look out onto is really, really important as well. So landscaping is absolutely crucial. Um, you know, it, it's uh, really, really important. Um, and then we've created this walk through the garden. So restoring the old gardens has been you know, crucial. I think we're planting 80 new trees, creating an arboretum. But I think the circular walk and using all sorts of tactics in terms of biodiversity, we've got our, um, water there, which is all our drainage, uh, all exposed as a pool. Um, so yeah, that's, a, I think, the first project, which is uh, breaking ground as we speak. So watch this space. Uh, this is project um, kind of one and a half. <laughs> and I suppose it shows uh, we had the same brief here, but in a different context. So this is in Falmouth, another retirement home of Pegasus Life. So um, done at the same time. So this goes on site very soon as well. But this is in a World Heritage site. Um, and, you know, we have to be careful about, you know, this idea of how a modern building would fit in. So we've got <coughs> this contemporary take on this kind of Falmouth vernacular, this beachside vernacular. So um, this five-story building um, has this view, which is amazing. And that kind of goes at panoramic all around the other side as well. It's just water. And on the left-hand side is Pendennis Headland. So that was really, really important to us. Normally, we're not so kind of obsessed with views. There's so many other things to be worried about, but you cannot ignore this as the driving force for that kind of how you respond to that site. So the big thing for us really was every bedroom, or at least the primary bedroom, and every living space should face that view. Because if you're bed bound, and you think about it, if you're kind of maybe later in life, if, if you are in bed more, you, you really want that connection. So that kind of drove, we went through many iterations, and it's easier said than done, but we finally came up with a configuration uh, which allowed that. Um, and that is based on the idea of this, which you know, normally we kind of shun uh, this idea of balcony or deck access, but actually for um, engendering a sense of social cohesion is, is actually really, really good, as long as it's well designed. So we've got these two meter wide um, uh, decks, to, it's actually to the north, so the sun is kind of doing funny things. Uh, it probably won't shine like that, shouldn't say that. But the idea of having benches, places to stop, dwell, planting out there, um, and kind of deep thresholds to the apartments as well to give a sense of address, really, really important. And then looking at the, the apartments themselves, again, they're touching on the, the kind of the larger size, all open plan, um, separating the, um, the, the, the dining, the kitchen as a pod in the central, and then the living room facing the sea. And then these large outdoor rooms. So kind of outside of the area schedule, we've got these 12 meter squared balconies. You know, normally we're kind of, they're probably five, six square meters, but 12 square meters, it really is a proper outdoor room. You get a large table out there if you need. And I think really important as well, I think you can see in the lower left hand side, again, this idea of how rooms might open out into each other. Again, if you are bed bound, what's your relationship with the rest of the apartment? So you've got sliding opening doors there, which mean that you've got guests, there, you know, you've got that connection. So really, really important, you know, simple moves, but um, I, I think it's important. And the room to the north, we've shown a bed in there, but that's really kind of a craft room or a hobby room or a home office, um, but all very flexible. Uh, and then kind of what the views are from those spaces as well. So we've got a few different configurations on that kind of left-hand plan, which just do slightly different things depending on where they are in the layout. But essentially, that is the, the kind of the driving um, typology in the development. Uh, and then we've got the ubiquitous uh, lounge facing the ocean as well. It's much smaller development here. We're kind of down to about 34 flats rather than, I think, 70 in Queen Victoria House. So less of a communal offer. I think you need that critical mass to have all that cool stuff um, to be working. So we've just got a, a lounge and a small business suite in, in this one. So the second project I'm going to show you, um, and again, looking at the kind of a, the, the ranges in people. So we've looked at retirement living. 
Um, and we were really interested in this project about kind of first time buyers, or I hate this term, I'm sure you do too, generation rent, about we're looking at kind of more housing for rental provision now rather than um, buyers. But actually how should that be different and how might that um, be different in terms of in, in this particular context? Now this is an old 1960s building in the centre of town behind Castle Park. Castle Park is that green bit in front of you there. Um, it's really hidden, actually, for such a big building. It's an eight-storey monolith, really. Um, you don't really see much of it. Um, interesting building. So it sits on this car parking podium, um, which you can kind of see from, from Vine Street. Um, awful car park podium, actually. Just, this is the front door to the building. Could you imagine that? Just let's put 60 car parking spaces right at the front door. It, nothing green there at all. Um, but really amazing floor plates when it's all stripped out, really, really flexible. Um, so our kind of first take on this, so this was looking at the kind of a private rental model. Um, what does the building want to do? Much like Queen Victoria House, but in a slightly different way. So kind of looking at the kind of the structural grid, the internal grid as well, um, and letting the apartments kind of respond to that. So it looked at many different models and many different kind of, you know, how we divvy the building up. And we kind of settled on a particular grid. And again, what was interesting about this, so the opposite end of the spectrum, rather than Queen Victoria House having these muscular big apartments, we looked at really compressing them. And how do you do that without being mean? You know, uh, so, you know, layouts are everything. Um, so this is our, I think, rather cool two-bed, uh, four-person flat. Um, so this is 63 square metres, which is on the smaller side of a two-bed in standard market housing. You would normally expect to get a tiny little piddly bedroom with a, a flat of this size and you would get a narrow living room. Um, so we've managed to get two double uh, bedrooms with en suites um, with a really wide 5.3 metre living space and uh, we've got no circulation in this flat whatsoever. Kind of some quirky things about it. You know, we've got these two, um, I suppose, equal bedrooms. And, well, they're kind of conceived as suites with their own, their own doors. When you think about it, I suppose that sense of address, ownership, someone's partying late at night, you know, <laughs> you want to shut them off and they've got their own door. I think it was a really nice idea. Um, and uh, I think both of those then focusing on that central space, um, really important. And then another key thing to this as well is if you're renting as well, you know, you've got, you've got stuff too um, and you don't want your stuff everywhere. Um, so we actually threw loads and loads of storage at this and used every opportunity to kind of max out the storage. Can, one of the cool ones really is the spine wall which goes the width of the column and that's kind of about 400 mil, so 300 mil of storage, full height, just stuff, you know. We've got, um, you know, sliding screens where if you've got snowboards, you've got decks, you've got records, you've got books, where do you put them? Well, actually, that's where you put them or your big TV. Um, so really, really cool actually, load probably twice as much storage as you would get elsewhere. Uh, and then the one beds were just another modulation of that. So we kind of just mix and match one and two beds. Um, so same principles. This is just a one bed, 48 square meter flat. Um, and these are the interiors. I had to laugh when I put this and I suddenly thought of this again. We kind of keep on, um, we, yeah, spot the difference. So I, will, I won't talk too much about how we expect people to live there. Um, and then another cool part about it as well, this rooftop pavilion again, so we've got these duplexes on top, got rid of the car parking on the deck to create this kind of area where the community can come alive, so a garden on the, um, on the terrace rather than um, cars. Um, and then creating this idea of a, a co-working space on the ground floor where people might work, rent space, um, but also spill out onto um, that garden, there's a cafe there, all that kind of cool stuff. And they've got the ubiquitous kind of cut holes into it and make this um, really cool staircase as well as part of that entrance and arrival sequence too where you might have all sorts of meetings just hang out as well by the cafe. Um, and that's the cafe, little cinema room, art venue and the deeper planned part where you could do nothing else. Uh, there's already cool stuff happening there, really good retro bike shop. So it's kind of coming alive anyway, although it is now just being sold and being converted to an office. So that ship has sailed. Oh yeah, cool bike stuff as well. Uh, yeah, so it's currently being converted into an office, which actually, you know, it, 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 it fits quite naturally. But it just goes to show all these old buildings, they can be anything, actually. So it's much better to work with the stock we've got rather than knock things down all the time. Um, so sadly gone, but fun project all the same. Um, this is a project 
in the middle. So those were kind of on both ends of the spectrum. So we've got first time buyers or generation rent and retirement living. This is kind of looking at uh, more family housing. Um, this is in Southmead in a former school site uh, called Dunmel. We're doing this with Hab Housing, who um, is Kevin McLeod, um, he, his housing development company. It's kind of not what you think it would be. It's not grand designs per se, but it's actually trying to solve a different problem within the housing market. A little bit about the site. So, it, it, you know, Dunmail, or Southmead, was kind of built on this model, this idea of a garden suburb, this utopian dream of kind of green open spaces and low densities, and, but also lots of kind of stuff to support that, you, you know, in terms of infrastructure. But unfortunately, kind of that didn't happen in Southmead. They just kind of built the houses, very low density, about 20, 24 dwellings per hectare, kind of spaced out with, you know, not a lot in between. So that's the context there, the site's on the right-hand side, and you kind of mainly low-rise, two-story, semi-detached buildings, um, houses with deep front gardens, all that kind of stuff. Um, really open site as well, so kind of where do you start? Um, this is kind of an overview of the brief, so it's really interesting brief, so it's, it's in equal measure, we've got private housing, we've got um, ethical rent, which will be rent which is, oh God, rent which is capped um, with long leases, <clears throat> and then we've got affordable, so all in equal measure, that's very rare, but also very difficult to do on a marginal site, so the values here are really, really depressed, so it's very difficult to do anything, uh, I suppose, um, you know, of that kind of stature. Um, so all very highly sustainable. Um, another key part of this is that they should be mixed up, so tenure blind, so no separation between affordable, private, and rent. All one happy uh, mix. So to put it into context, this is kind of what's being built all over Bristol in terms of the outer suburbs. I'm not going to say which developer this is, but essentially is these kind of noddy boxes which are just plonked in kind of a random fashion. I think what, what, what they tend to do is just kind of squiggle a road pattern, whatever, they close their eyes and kind of do it. And then they get the little stamps out and just get their little monopoly houses and go, yeah, 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 yeah. And that's a master plan. And you can kind of have that one or you can have any one of these ones, any squiggle you like, um, but quite random and kind of all over the place. But that is the context of, of the market which this project is embedded in, that that's our competitors. And therefore, it's really, really, you know, puts pressure on all of the appraisals because we've got to deliver the same stuff they do. So you can have one of them, one of them, one of them, one of them. You know, th that is the context. And these are done very cheaply, so therefore we had to do ours very cheaply as well because we are providing far more social housing than any of these developments, which again puts pressure on the delivery of what we're doing. So go back, going back to this again, really, I suppose that's that and that. I don't know why I put that in, but uh, I thought it would be funny at the time. Um, but HAB they have got an incredible kind of focus on social sustainability and sustainability as central. I mean, in a way, it's not really about the architecture, because it can't be. It's got to be a place in a community first. And the architecture, as long as you do everything kind of sensibly and it's rigorously delivered and well detailed, kind of the architecture is secondary. It's really about the tactics you can do for free, which they should be if it's well designed. Um, which kind of engenders that sense of community. So I'd say, you know, this is lazy development. That could be configured in a hundred different ways to make that work in a much more focused way. So how do we go about that? So where do we start? So for us, always, it's about the master plan. It's about the arrangement, uh, having something which is highly, highly legible in terms of that layout. So I'll kind of walk you through kind of uh, some quick steps as to kind of the key moves we made. So you start with a blank site, um, amazing site actually to the north. We've got this really, really cool kind of green space with stretches from Blaise Castle all the way down to the gorge. So the connection to that is always really important to us, uh, both as amenity, but also ec ecologically as well. Um, so the first key move for us, really creating that connection to that green space, we drove a green street all the way through the site. So the initial aspirations were this would have no cars at all. This would just be a green lane running through it. But then you kind of get into the mechanics of how you get your bins out, how you do emergency vehicles, all that. So we've got to get very, very small kind of access route running through this. But predominantly, this is the social focus of the, of the site, 20 meter wide, green lane. And that's kind of where you go climb a tree, kick a ball, do all these kind of cool things. But it also creates a vital link for the community up to this green space, um, you know, for dog walkers, walkers, whatever. 
So that's the kind of the main driver, um, and an idea, some sketches about how that might look and feel. Um, uh, so yeah, a real sense of you know, how the houses kind of face onto this as well. I'll talk about that in a second, but yeah, that's really important. Um, it, we're kind of split roughly 50% apartments, 50% houses, and we decided to put the apartments to the north of the site, kind of facing onto this, um, um, this Elderberry Walk, this space, because uh, there's a really nice kind of row of trees, all about 15 meters high, and we thought that was a really nice relationship between these mature trees and these three-story blocks. These will be the only three-story blocks for miles around, so actually, I thought it was a really nice part of the site to put these. It really separates them from the kind of the more suburban context um, lower down on the site. Um, and roads are actually really expensive. So, you know, we could be really, really economic with what we do with them. They've got to work so hard. So the kind of the main route within the site, so we're making connections with the wider kind of road network. So we drive a street which runs all the way around the perimeter of the site. Um, and that's kind of working really hard. We decided to put all the parking on the street. A lot of these developments have parking courts and um, parking to the rear, which is really dreadful for the activity on the street. Put the cars on the street whenever you can, because actually that's where the, the life of, of streets is, and you really want to use it. So actually, you've got to be very careful about how you do that. Though. So we never have more than three car parking spaces in a row without having screening, so it doesn't want to feel like a sea of cars. Um, so it's kind of really, really tricky one to do because there's a, there's a high demand for parking in these kind of outer lying suburbs. And then as that roots around the kind of the architecture and the, the scale starts to kind of taper down as it meets the existing street pattern. Um, I think it's really important to have a hierarchy of streets as well. So not just streets which are 18, 20 meters wide. Um, you really would kind of want to have that hierarchy so it kind of aids wayfinding and just identity of, of the kind of the neighborhood. So through the middle of the development, we've got this Muse Street, so it's 12 metres wide. Think about Coronation Street, you know, just a bit more compressed. Sometimes we're a bit too afraid to put buildings close to each other, but it's really, really good in terms of, you know, um, that idea of street. So we've got this kind of 12 metre street with parking, with houses facing onto it in the centre of the site. Um, this is actually a project we did in Barking. This is council housing. And again, this is the scale, although we are two-storey rather than three-storey. But we do have street trees, which really do help soften that kind of sense of, of you know, that the, the, the kind of um, um, architecture as well. Um, and then we've got these four parcels of, of land, which we kind of, I suppose, develop. Um, and we looked at many different configurations about how the houses kind of work here, but really, really important, actually, about... And I could, have, I could go back to those other kind of wonky developments I showed you, but the relationship of houses to the street is really, really important. And having clear fronts and clear backs and that relationship, again, is really important. How the houses turn the corner, really important. So we kind of micro-planned each of these blocks within an inch of its life um, and just really, really worked on that idea of relationship and how things work together. Um, and that is kind of one of them. You can see where we get these quirky corners, kind of dealing with that geometry as well, rather than kind of, kind of celebrate those corners, really important. So we've kind of oversized the houses in that, those kind of areas because, you know, you've got these kind of slightly weird acute angles, which sometimes can be difficult to put furniture into. So we kind of made those a bit more muscular to compensate for those funny angles. But they're, they're, they're really fun, actually. And they kind of really give a sense of that kind of celebrating the corner and just having um, some special moments with those acute angles, really nice. Um, kind of going back to streets again, any opportunity we can get, it's about making that relationship and that sense of social interaction with the streets. So having um, kind of setback landscaped areas, front doors facing streets, but also we've got a porch, put balconies on top as well. So um, it's quite a cheap tactic, but really, really good as well. So that you can imagine facing onto that green street, all this activity and all this. Um, it's both surveillance and it's also good socially as well. Um, and then that is the master plan, um, kind of as it stands. Um, and you can really get a sense of what we tried to do with this drawing. The architecture really is secondary. The landscape and all the other things is kind of holding it together. Um, a key thing for us really is, is the typologies. I think I've talked about them in the other projects as well. And that's no different here. Even though you know, we didn't have any money to spend whatsoever, we designed these I suppose, houses and apartments within an inch of their life as well, because again, that's for free. Why not? Every square meter should be spared and, and kind of used really well. 
Um, so we did lots of kind of prototyping. These are 3D prints we kind of made, looking at the inside arrangements, looking at the outside, how they work together, how they work as kind of um, uh, arrangements in streets together. Um, and then in the apartment as well, we really wanted to kind of look at something which was 100% dual aspect. Quite difficult to do in this market. That means you've got windows on kind of both sides, get cross ventilation. Um, um, but also, again, thinking about the social focus on this, we just wanted clusters, this mansion block cluster, uh, which is two apartments per, per stair core. So kind of, it's the real cup of sugar moment, you know, knock on your neighbor's door because they are your neighbor. It's not a row of, you know, 18 front doors. So that was really quite nice. So it's not an original um, kind of development. You can see here the Barbican, um, and it's also kind of Marcel Brewer was doing it in the 1960s. But we looked at kind of, I suppose, reinventing this again for um, the rental market. So we come up with this um, kind of very similar arrangement. But I suppose the key thing here for us is we've got two equal size bedrooms um, and we did so many different kind of versions of this. These are quite small flats, 61 square meters, which is national space standard compliant, which it had to be. Um, but getting two double bedrooms into that kind of size, that was difficult to making them both equal in size. Again, that was quite a difficult thing to do. So this kind of went through many, many iterations to get to where we are, but also wide living rooms. Um, so four and a half meters wide. Um, and then in terms of the houses, um, we designed them so they could be anything. It made the master plan very flexible as we were going through it. So we, we, we gave everything um, the same width. We designed them as a shell and core. So the staircase and, and kind of entrance sequence is consistent in all the different house types. And then we just looked at very, very simple kind of tactics and very different arrangements for each of those shelling cores in terms of it could be a, um, a two bed or go up to the loft, it could be three bed, uh, or you go deeper, it could be three on two levels or four on three. Um, and then the idea of customization. So within that, you can have a kitchen at the front, a kitchen at the back, you can have a home office or an ensuite, or you go into the loft and you can buy this at, at the point of sale. So early in the sales process, before we've committed too much on site, the purchaser can kind of get all this for free. So it's kind of customization light, as it were. It's not kind of high-end customization, but it is a level of kind of choice you give um, the purchaser early on. And then another kind of quirky part of that, really thinking about customization too early on in the process, about maybe looking at that threshold, that entrance. This is Burntwood School again, but every single department has got a different tile and a different kind of graphic. And that idea could be really interpreted very easily, again, within the porches throughout. So it's an idea we're currently working on about, kind of, again, how we do customization light in a very kind of cheap um, context or you know, how we can do these kind of things and give the, the user this, kind of, uh, this choice early on. And then in terms of the architecture, it's very restrained, it has to be said. I'm looking at a very restrained, robust palette of materials, which is contextual. Um, so just very simple brick, uh, a light brick, and slate, and a bit of render as well. Um, much like this, this is North London Hospice. Again, very restrained um, uh, kind of palette of materials, but very well executed and detailed. So that's kind of our, our kind of reference point. Um, so early kind of CGI is what we're kind of looking at for that. Um, and then, uh, how am I doing on time? Yeah. And then also this idea of having some special moments. So yeah, we've got those kind of quirky corners and a few other things and the landscaping is awesome. Um, but we've got this substation which we can't move because it's going to cost too much money. So this horrible thing on the corner of the site. Um, so I think they're going to charge us 100 grand to move it, which would have just killed the appraisal. So the idea of working with a local artist, and we're going to kind of camouflage this or kind of work with it and celebrate it. We don't know quite what it's going to be yet. We're kind of writing up a working brief for an artist, but we're going to have a bit of fun with that, and that becomes the marker for the site. Um, so it could be a really special moments, or, or it could fail terribly. That's, that's what I quite like about it. Um, and then just the final, this is the tenure mix. You can see the kind of multicolored. That's, I suppose, all of the different tenures mixed up um, throughout. Um, and that's it. That's the kind of the current master plan. This has got, or it's about to get planning this week, and we'll move to site in February. But a um, really, really interesting project, which is really, really good. Um, kind of, I think it's going to be great in that particular market context as well. So that's it. Mm -hmm.